Okay, this is the May 16th, 2023 meeting of the WebRTC Working Group. We have two hours together. And like to remind you that we are operating under the W3C IPR policy, which is at the link below, and only people and company that are listed on the other link are allowed to make substantive contributions. So uh, today we're going to cover a number of things, use cases, some more RTC extension and media capture extension, uh, issues in PRs, and some new work, ICE controller and RTP transport. Uh, and we have a bunch of future meetings uh, that are listed below. All right. So the slides are up on the wiki. And we're being recorded, just a reminder, and it will be made public. Do we have a note taker? I'll do it. Okay, thank you, Don. All right, so the cool, cool of code of conduct we're operating under means we're supposed to keep things cordial and professional. So let's try to do that. I think you all are, have figured out how things work, but we do run a tight speaker queue, so raise your hand to get into it and lower it to get out of it. We will mute you if you jump the queue, so please don't do that. Um, and tell us your full name uh, before you speak so we can help get it in the minutes. All right. I don't think we'll use polls today, but if we do, uh, you know what it does. All right. So just about document status, um, we have to say this every meeting, and sometimes it gets confusing, and we will be talking about use cases. Uh, the point is that um, editor's drafts do not represent consensus, working drafts do. It's possible to merge some PRs that lack consensus if a note's attached, and we'll be dealing with a use case document where that's been done liberally and maybe not such a great idea. We'll see. Okay, so we're going to talk about use cases. Uh, Tim's going to lead that discussion. Then we'll talk about extensions, ICE controller, RTP, and wrap up. So we'll try to be good about time also. Uh, thanks. All right, so I'm going to hand it over to Tim. RGTNV use cases. Yeah, so um, uh, the extended use case document has just changed its name. And, and I ask myself whether it's even useful since it's kind of caused us some uh, difficulty, I think, recently. And, and you know, the answer is yes. I think it, it has some, some use. Um, I mean, it's been cited recently in, in, in new uh, feature so it is something that kind of crops up and so it has a use and can it be improved well almost certainly i think there's quite a lot wrong with it at the moment and the purpose of this kind of 20 minutes or whatever it is um is to try and look for guidance and make and come to some sort of agreement about how we might improve it and what we think it's for next slide please so uh, as, as a preparation for this i reread it and, and it references RFC 7478, so I read them both together. And, um, you know, honestly, it's pretty unsatisfactory. I mean, kind of random example, but like 7478 is really dated. Um, you know, it, it, it isn't what we're doing with WebRTC. I mean, it sort of is, but it isn't. And it talks about things that like, I haven't talked about for 10 years, like telephony terminals. So uh, it, it's kind of out of date in some ways. And, and then if you look at like at, at the NV use cases document as was, it talks about things like that aren't actually use cases. Like funny hats isn't in my view a use case. It's a feature on an existing use case. Um, but I, the requirements for funny hats are still valid and useful. And what's more, the resulting API points are fantastically popular and useful way beyond the hats or even for uh, video conferencing. It's like there are users outside video conferencing. So like, that tells me that maybe there's something wrong with the way that we're treating this document. And um, yeah, like and the other way around, uh, like section 3.9, and we'll talk about the status of the rest of the document in a minute. Um, I, it's got no consensus, but it's already been done by Wish and Whip effectively. And so like we, we, we find ourselves in a weird position of like this document sort of almost like it's an orphan or something, I don't know. 
Um, it's kind of been overtaken by standards and events and, and things. And I, and I think that's a shame because it's still got a use. Next slide, please. So um, I, I must thank, I think, Bernard for, for filling out this, the details of this. I, I don't intend to kind of go through a huge amount of this full status in, in a lot of depth, but I think it's worth like running through it quickly so that we've got a sense of where we are with it. Um, you know, we've changed the name because NV isn't what we're doing anymore. This is extended use cases. Um, and there are nine consensus use cases, but some of them have non-consensus requirements. There are seven non-consensus use cases in there. Uh, there are 31 open issues, um, you know, of varying ages, but 18 of them been open for two years. Um, and so, yeah, uh, it's not in a particularly healthy state from that point of view. And, and that begs the question, you know, what should we do with non-consensus use cases that aren't progressing? What should we do with non-consensus requirements? And, and, and kind of what do we do with use cases where there are no requirements or proposals? Next slide, please. So just to dive into a few, few examples here, or I'm probably not going to kind of read the whole thing, but you know, we've got the multi-party gaming for which the requirements have consensus and there are some proposals. We've got the mobile calling service for which there are non-consensus requirements, but it has consensus. Um, we have the video conferencing with a central server, which to be honest is kind of the core use case that everyone's using WebRTC for, and all the requirements have consensus and there are relevant proposals. Uh, next slide, please. And then we've got use cases, more use cases with consensus, like the file sharing, um, with us, there's a proposal for there, and it's got the require, it's got the consensus. Um, there's the Internet of Things for which we don't have consensus on one of the requirements, but we do have a proposal that's associated with that requirement to some extent. Um, and, and then we've got uh, virtual reality gaming, where we've got consensus and that's in a quite a good state and then funny hats which as i say i don't think is a use case i mean i'm not even sure that some of these others are but i'm not sure that but it's in good state from the point of view of the kind of paperwork and then like the machine learning is interesting because it effectively has a bunch of the same requirements as funny hats but it's a different use case um and uh but not yeah, that, that's a weird one, uh, Tim, because it really begs the question of what these use cases are for. And one right. thing, I had some confusion in the IETF, and, and maybe Dom or someone can explain the W3C process, but in the IETF, we have an applicability statement document and a use case document. They're not the same. So in the IETF, there's no requirement that the use cases cover everything that the standard can do. Right. The applicability statement will tell you stuff that's that it, the standard is inappropriate for. Right. But I don't know, like in the W3C, is there an idea? The reason we have machine learning here, even though it, it doesn't give you any new requirements, is people said, well, if you don't put it in, people will think it can't be used for that. But it's the ITF that's considered an inappropriate argument and an argument for another kind of document, which is the applicability statement. So, so let's. Uh, let, let's park that because I think we we come back to that. I think it's it's well worth um, like raising it at this point. But like maybe we'll hopefully get a little clearer on on where we get to with that when we're a little further through the um, okay. through. Thank this. you. So um, yeah, there we go. So we've got a bunch of use cases, more use cases with consensus. The don't pwn my video conferencing. Um, and there's a sort of semi theme here, which is that video conferencing tends to get consensus and other things sort of tend not to, but that's a that's a probably not statistically accurate. Um, and that that's got encoded transform as a proposal that's that's on on the go. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then we've got a bunch of non consensus use cases um, for things like low latency streaming. Um, and uh, low latency broadcast with fan out and decentralized messaging. And, and I would point out that we've got non-consensus on these use cases, but people are out there doing them, right? And so it's kind of odd situation that we, we sort of don't believe that they're use cases, but they are obviously because people are using them. 
Um, now, whether I'm not quite sure what that means, but it slightly bothers me. Um, next slide, please. And, and then we've got, um, again, as I said before, the low complexity signaling. We've said there is no requirements, it's non-consensus, and there are no relevant proposals, except that WISH is exactly that, and that's what's happening. Um, and, and the likewise one-way media, WISH is doing this, uh, and a bunch of other people are doing this, but we have no consensus on the use case. Um, and, and we've got a ton of open issues on it, and the requirements are in a, a in non-consensus state. And so we're kind of, we're in the weird situation of almost saying, we don't think you should be doing this when people are out there doing it, which is, I think is not a positive thing. Next slide, please. So I, I kind of stepping back, I thought, well, you know, what is this use case document for? What's the use case for the use case document? Um, you know, and who is the intended readership and what will they do with it? And then of course, like, how should it evolve? Because I think that's one of the things that we're not doing well with this document is, is letting it evolve. Um, it's not a living document, but it's also not definitive. So it's kind of falls between two kinds of documents that I think would be more desirable. Um, so I kind of put two, not very funny actually, hats on to, to think about that. Next slide, please. So the hat number one is, is kind of what I'm talking to you as now, which is like a member of the working group. And, and what I want from this document is, is effectively a to-do list. It's a kind of, you know, where are we, what are we trying to do? Where have we got to? Maybe to some extent, um, a progress meter, but also a yardstick to see whether the changes that we people are bringing to us are suitable, whether they fit like what we've said we're trying to do. Um, and, and, it, and I think also it's desirable to have a way of maybe decoupling the scenarios from the requirements. So it's, you know, it's very easy to kind of dive in with, with the requirements or even the solution, you just come up with an API point that you feel like it would be nice to have without the backstory of what it's going to get used for and, and how. And I think those are the sort of the purpose of this document from my perspective is to help decouple and help to shape the scenarios and the requirements so that we kind of understand that. Uh, but also, um, I think we need a place to define our direction and aspirations because like particularly 74, 78, and to some extent, the original uh, def definitive work for this is out of date. Like we've been doing this a long time and, and the world has changed. And I think that we need some kind of forward direction on this. And I'm happy in, in a minute for people to bring up other things to add to this list. I, I don't think it's exclusive at all. It's just like what I came up with. Um, next slide, please. And then the other hat that I could put on and did is, is like a developer who's building on WebRTC every day, using the APIs, consuming them. And what I want from a document like this is confidence that my API usage will continue to be supported and a guide to see like what I might be able to use in the near future, what sort of features are coming down the pipe that might be sensible to like put in my product roadmap and a place potentially to ask for new API features, a place to say, hey, I've got this, you know, aquarium with turtles in it and I need this in it. And, and, and so you have a place to kind of raise that discussion and, and what features you might need to, to meet the turtle use case. Um, and a way to know what is possible to do now. Now, I realize that's kind of, difficult, but it's a changing API space. And I think as a, a top level guide to kind of, well, you know, these are things that work uh, is, is pretty desirable. Um, and, and again, I uh, feel absolutely free in a minute to kind of come up with other things to add to this list because I, I don't claim that it's exclusive. Uh, next slide, please. So the reason all this matters is, is, and I had it kind of brought home to me very firmly um, recently when I was in a Slack chat and this floated past. It wasn't addressed to me. I just happened to be in the chat. Um, it says, we've got an answer from the WebRTC team. They basically confirmed that they're doing what they're doing intentionally since they believe the tech 
is meant for two-way audio conversations, not one-way streaming like in our use case. And I, I, I kind of, I sort of felt tempted to dive in there and say, hey, you're wrong, it's, it's, that's not true. But like, that is what they were told. Um, and that is the sort of per pervasive view. And I think this document can help move the line back to other use cases rather than having these folks wander off and you know, reinvent something else or, or do something different, um, use HLS or whatever it is that they, they, they want low latency. But anyway, so I think, it, think we, that tells me that we do have a problem. Um, next slide, please. So I have some proposals. And, and, and again, tip of the hat to Bernard for, for kind of tidying these up and adding to them. Um, so like proposal to rename it, um, call it extended use cases. I think that's actually in process at the moment, but uh, I think it's, it, it's a good thing to do. Um, I want us to focus on things that we can only or maybe even best do with WebRTC. And that means I think refocusing a bit onto P2P. Um, you know, there are other APIs that are, that are coming along that are doing the filling in the gaps in the other spaces. And I think P2P is the thing that WebRTC does, uniquely does. And I think we should like try and bring the emphasis back, which is actually already in 74, 78, uh, bring a little bit of emphasis back to, to that. Um, and I think we should take out use cases that are now met by other standards. Things that like, you know, web transport or web codex or whatever does, we should be removing the use cases and, and their associated requirements if, um, if they're already done somewhere else. We do though, I think, need to include use cases that have no requirements, but that extend 74, 78. So that, you know, the, particularly things like the IoT stuff, which is dear to my heart, like it doesn't even crop up in 74, 78, but like it's relevant and interesting and, and a good use case for this technology, I think. Um, yeah, but then more practically on a kind of document level, I think we should remove use cases that don't get consensus within a few months because this document is kind of full of stuff that's been lying around for far too long. And we should remove requirements that don't get consensus within a few months. Um, so if we don't get a consensus on something, we should just drop it. It can come back when we've kind of, the world has moved or all the proposals were refined. Um, Bernard. Why, why don't you finish and just keep me okay. in the queue? Cool, All right. Um, so, and then um, I think we should remove use cases that don't add new requirements with the exception of the ones that extend RFC 74, 78. I think there's a little tension there and I think there's a discussion to be had about what what those place, how that like requirement balance goes. Um, I think proposed API changes should probably all include changes to the use case doc. Like, I don't, like why are we changing the API if there's no use case for it? So, so I think, you know, I think we need to tie this into the process a little deeper. And that also um, comes back to like what the relationship between this document is and the explainers. I think explainers are very useful, but maybe this document should contain pointers to explainers so that it becomes much more of a living document. Um, and I think the other thing that we, we've struggled with in this document is, is the input, where the input comes from. Um, I think we, if we can, we need to find a way of broadening that. I'm happy to kind of use WebRTC.nu as a feed-in from developers if that's thought to be useful, um, or we have some other shape that allows us to bring stuff in here. So we now have a queue. Um, oh, next slide. I think we think this is the discussion point slide. Uh, we have a queue. Let's see who's in it. Yeah, discussion time. So we've got eight minutes for discussion. Uh, who have we got in the queue? Um, Harold. I th oh, well, yeah, okay. I, I think I was first. first. I think Bernard was first, but the queue says Harold yeah. was, but anyway. So uh, I think these are a lot of very good suggestions, Tim. I'd like to just give my opinion on each of them. Um, I do actually think uh, that the peer-to-peer -peer aspect is important because it comes up a lot. 
Um, and it's been a confusing point in other use cases and other working groups as well, where what I see from developers is often they disagree with the way other working groups have done the use cases. As an example, streaming use cases, many of them actually require peer-to-peer -peer operation. Um, game streaming is a good example of something that, you know, I've talked to game streamers. It's very popular in WebRTC. In fact, all the major game streaming services use WebRTC. And many use them not just client server, but also peer to peer. So um, I think that what I hear coming up from developers, if it's peer to peer, they're forced to use WebRTC. And a lot of the things that other groups think are, are client server are actually peer to peer. So I think that one is a, a really good one. Um, certainly, I, I think, um, you know, when you say met by other standards, I would like to see wide usage. Because there are other there are people claim, for example, we're the best game streaming stuff. When I talk to developers, they basically say, nope, I'm not interested in that stuff. I want to use WebRTC. So I think it, it's not just that they're met by other standards, but, you know, the other standards are actually being used. Um, and then, you know, if they don't get consensus, I do agree with this. If, if something's been lying around, as you said, for some of the things lying around for two years are people asking for stuff. But some of the stuff lying around for a long time is things that were just the uh, issues have not been answered. And I think I think you have a really great point that leaving these things in the document probably is not a great idea. Um, and, the, and you know, you can always have another PR to clean it up. But if it's lying in there with no consensus um, and if there are requirements that where the issues aren't get fixed, just rip it out. I think. It, um, but there is a very big question. I think I'd like to try to get some guidance from here, which is. Are we saying that if there isn't a use case for it, it doesn't mean it can be done? Obviously, people don't, like you said, Tim, they're doing it anyway. So do they need our blessing? Like if we don't bless game streaming officially, will it? Will everyone shut down their game streaming service? I, 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 I mean, just to pick up on that one, I do think it's a risk, particularly for smaller software houses. Like if you're a small developer and, and you don't know for sure that the API point is is whether your use case is met accidentally because it just happened to be a side effect of something that Google wanted in Meet, or whether it's something that's that's defined as like as part of the standard because it's something that the standards body thinks needs to be done and it's been documented. I think there's a big difference there. Like um, and, and you know my 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 quote from the the uh, Slack chat like indicates that. I mean, because the next piece of that Slack chat was a long discussion about whether they could move away from WebRTC, um, which is a shame because as far as I'm concerned, what they're doing is absolutely core to what we should be supporting. But they don't believe, and to be honest, the people, they, the other people they talk to don't believe that it's a core use case. But but even if, even if you put it in a document, right, say, great, the WebRTC working group thinks this thing is the, fantastic. There's no requirement for any browser to support it. I mean, I, I, we're not the we're not the use case. We sure, sure. Go to, we go uh, to Safari and say, "Ah, you didn't do this use case." Like, you know what I'm saying? It's no, t t totally, totally agree there. But but when somebody comes up with a change to the API that says, uh, "Okay, maybe we've got a um, we want to change the API in some way, API shape," and it removes the ability to do that. Um, and then there's no way of saying from the document point of view, hey, but we agreed that this was something we wanted to do. You know, so I, I agree that it doesn't have any effect outside the standards space, but it does. Um, but it does within. Let, let's, um, Bernard, if you can finish the points and we, we'll your 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 response, and we'll get to the other the others as well. Yeah, uh, I the think other I, hands said, up. I I basically addressed these, so I'll shut up. Bye, Harold. Yeah, so uh, one of the things that surprised me in our handling of this document has been the has been the problems we've been getting with consensus on use cases. I mean, the most recent example I personally encountered was uh, the one-way use cases, where I claim that we have developers who are eager to do them, and the working group says, no, we don't have consensus that these are valid use cases. That seems bizarre to me. And uh, an even worse one is the one that's been hanging around forever with, uh, or was kicked out 
uh, with uh, trusted JavaScript uh, 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 conferencing because that's what everyone's doing and we don't have a use case we don't have consensus on the use case so we so we delete it from the use case document that's nuts right right so i have a problem with the distance between the use cases document and the use cases that i need to support in the real world i think that's enough for me peter Uh, I hear a lot of things I really like. I'd want to give a plus one to getting our use cases in order, a plus one to having a place where developers can ask for things and see a status of what it is. Um, and then I think it would make sense to have a status for everything people have asked for, just even if it's a history, to say there was a consensus on, no, this isn't part of WebRTC. There's a consensus on, yes, we're going to do it, but we're not sure when. Uh, maybe there's one on, yes, we're doing it right now, and it'll be soon. And maybe there's one that's like, we don't have consensus, and maybe there's one that's, um, we would like to do it, but we can't figure out how. Maybe we need to figure out how, something like that. Right. So it's I like think, someone I, can ask for things and see a status. I think we need to be careful that asking for things is, is, isn't is asking for features. I think we need to be careful that this is a, it isn't just a, f a feature request list. But I mean, I take your point absolutely. I think it's good, but I think we we there's some care to be had. Uh, Yanivar. Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, a lot of good points. Thank you, Tim. For for I definitely agree. This needs a cleanup, and I like a lot of the points you, you're uh, proposing here. Uh, uh, one thing I, I don't feel you mentioned is scope. I think uh, we should be clear about scope for this, and that this is only for this working group. You mentioned removing things that have other standards, and I think it's useful to look at the history of this document. Next version was supposed to be WebRTC 2.0, and it was an important uh, part in our lives where we're, we finished 1.0 and we were deciding what are we going to do next. And there wasn't a monolithic 2.0. Instead, it was more of an unbundling of WebRTC into other specs. So uh, that's why a lot of use cases are in there, like you mentioned, Wish. Uh, that doesn't need to be, does, is that me, does that, that Wish is existing, does that mean the use case stays in or that it goes out? And I think it's important to, for it to serve our process, the W3C process, which is that this is not, we're not supposed to document everything for web developers. Other websites can do that. <clears throat> I think the purpose of these cases is to drive our discussions in the working group and on GitHub. So when someone opens an issue, we would say, hey, I have a problem and you know, I'm solving it. We don't have a great leader. So we have to have some kind of system that says, this is in our app, right? So I would support having use cases drive the work that this working group does. And uh, if there are other working groups like Web Codex, Web Transport, uh, Wish, uh, that's, that's for them to organize, I think. So we're now at time. Um, I'll leave it to the chairs to tell us when we're, when we're gonna pull the plug and Tony's in the queue. Yeah, let's just drain the queue and then pull the plug. Okay. I just had a quick point on, uh, I think I agree with uh, removing use cases met by other standards when they have wide adoption in the other places. Uh, my only thought was, I just hope this doesn't mean that we end up sort of accidentally siloing where you can have like peer-to-peer -peer or those other things just because it happened to be in another standard. Um, do you think there's space for having like the need of a use case for integration between WebRTC and these other standards in this kind of place? Uh, I would, I would thought that was given, but maybe you're right. Maybe it needs stating. Yuan. Um, in terms of scope, I would echo what Yanni is saying: is that this document is for the WebRTC working group. So it's mostly uh, we are the main users, and the driver is to add new things or add new features. So that's the scope. Uh, I, I agree with uh, Howard that it, it's not very successful. Um, and other working groups, other uh, bodies are using explainers, which is uh, a bit better because you can have the use case, the requirements, and some example plus eventually uh, some API or proposals uh, in, a, in a free format. And then it, it's much easier to uh, for us to actually, yeah, we have the requirement, we, have, we can match all of these. 
Uh, while currently you have a use case in one document, you might have uh, a PR somewhere else and so on. So it's, it's a bit more difficult. So uh, maybe we should try to use more explainers and uh, less uh, separate use case documents. I, I, I think that I, I like that. And I think the relationship with explainers is probably central to the solution. The question is, that is un still unclear to me, is what remains in a, in a use case document? Is it just like a headline use case and a pointer to an explainer um, and a list of those, which I think is actually possibly a doable thing, but we need to think about what that will be. And I'm happy to have this conversation um, on, on the list. Now, uh, Peter, you're back in the queue somehow. I, I think we should probably wrap it up. Uh, okay. so, 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 so my proposal is is to take this to to the list. Let people, I want input from people. I'm prepared to put some time into doing some of this, but I want to make sure that we understand uh, what it is that we're we're trying to achieve. I want to broaden the scope a little more than 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 just formally for the W3C, but like maybe we'll discuss that elsewhere. Um, for next month, what I'd like to do, Tim, is to continue this discussion uh, in the next month's meeting. Um, I will try to create some PRs to address the proposals that have been discussed here, and then we can talk about them, you know, the, the merit of the individual PRs, but basically a, a bunch of removal PRs. Um, okay. Sounds good. Next month. Thank you. All right. Uh, Okay, uh, Henrik and Fippo, Media Capture and WebRTC Extension stuff. And we'll start with 134 PR 164. Fippo. Yes, this is a process problem we have because the WebRTC Extension spec in order to implement the header extension API is trying to modify the JSEP RFC and Mozilla's Eric Rescola objected to that, which is valid. And we currently are in the state that RFC 8829-BIS, the successor to RFC 8829, is in the editor's RFC editor's queue. So it's close to publication. Just inadvertently, you agreed to make a small adjustment to the text, which will hopefully get into that new RFC once it gets published. There's a discussion in progress on the ITF list if you want to Voice your opinion there, please do. If you want to review the pull request, also please do. And that's the status of things. Many thanks to Justin Newberry for pushing this. Any questions about this one? All right. Just a comment on the claim of an engine around the RFC editor errata process. <clears throat> the RFC editor errata process is not the process that makes changes to ITF documents. Only ITF uh, documents do that. In practice, uh, an internet draft is, uh, it is an, update, an updated version of the spec, but uh, errata are not. So the idea that, the, that our attempt to modify JSEP was an end run around the errata process is wrong. It was an attempt to work around the absence of a, a working ITF process. But now that we have an ITF process that has turned a crank with a with a vetted draft, I think okay, we I think we can do that. We can deal with that. I agree. Fingers crossed. Okay, the next slide is about the question, when are keyframes generated? And WebRTC is very light on that. It doesn't even mention the term keyframe at all. And we have issues from that because it is a side effect of some API calls. For example, set parameters may cause keyframes to be generated when you change the scale resolution down by factor, but that may not be true in some cases for some codecs. Similarly, when you set active to false and then to true again, that will generate a keyframe, but it will not generate a keyframe in other 
cases where it is desirable, such as turning a high resolution simulcast layer off that will generally not generate a keyframe on the other layers, even though an SFU might actually require that keyframe to switch anyone on those layers down to the lower layers. And that causes a short freeze for the receivers, which is a degradation quality that we would like to avoid. It also causes a lot of bandwidth spikes because you have these keyframes on all layers in certain implementations. Next slide. So the proposal to solve that is to allow requesting a keyframe explicitly when you call set parameters. That makes this implicit thing that we have, this implicit ability to call the keyframe explicit. And in terms of semantics, that is going to be similar to the RTCP fair message defined in an RFC. So at the earliest opportunity, the encoder is asked to generate a keyframe. It may not be able to do that currently because of bandwidth constraints and other things, but we have a very defined behavior for this fair message. So this pull request 167 basically supersedes the early attempt from encoded transform. It is actually much more integrated, so you don't have to define on which RITs it operates and so on. And the RITs are automatically validated because they're already validated in set parameters. The other problem with having a standalone IP API for that is that it would often be used with set parameters and then would cause race conditions. So that turned out to be not good in practice. Any questions or comments? Yanivar. You're muted, Yanivar. Oh, thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so looking at the PR, I see it's a request frame Boolean which is a bit odd in that it's not really a parameter, is it? So uh, why not just make it a method, I guess? But uh, this is on bike shedding. I, I don't have a necessarily a, a problem with the proposal other than that I understand there already is an API for this. So I'll let others talk to that. But uh, it seems like maybe it could be a counter or maybe it should be a separate method. Unless there was a specific reason I missed on the previous slide about uh, uh, combining it with set parameters for some synchronizing. It is mostly because I didn't want to separate these two into two methods because that causes all kinds of issues. And <clears throat> like, um, like which one? Um, What's an example of an issue? Take the example of deactivating a simulcast layer. Okay. Yeah. Then you um, need to, most of the time, you want to generate a keyframe on the lower layer, or maybe both lower layers. Right. Yeah, I guess you could do a method and then do a promise all or something, and you could define it to be synchronous, uh, to be synced. But uh, yeah, it's, it's that versus the oddity of having a, a Boolean attribute that you, you set in order to trigger an action. That's bike yes, setting. So we'll get off the key. already may cause a keyframe. <clears throat> so you have two different methods causing a keyframe. That may cause two keyframes to be generated. Hmm. All right, thanks. Yeah. Tim was next, I think. Yeah, I, I, I guess my only real question is are there situations where set parameters isn't the right place for it? Like, are there some kind of, I don't know. Encryption related thing where you're not actually doing you're not actually doing set parameters, but you do need to start start from a keyframe. That's I can't think of case. one, but I wonder. That's the use case what that was the reason for putting it in encoded transform. But so far in Chrome we have not needed that at all for end-to-end -end encryption. Okay, so so people thought it was necessary and it's turned out not to be, or I haven't heard from anyone doing end-to-end -end encryption in Chrome requesting that feature particularly. Okay. 
How about? Yeah, I don't like uh, I don't like the concept of uh, having set parameters setting not something that's not a parameter. I would I would rather follow in a trans tradition of uh, set local description that suddenly generated descriptions and say that okay we make a new call that that called set parameters and send keyframes, which guarantees that they do they do, they do them synchronously. But set parameters should, in my opinion. I mean, get parameters should return what's what set parameters set sets, and uh, and the and the request keyframe is not something that should be that should be set when it's not set. Yes, but for example, you have a counter example with the maximum bitrate, which is typically unset in get parameters on the first call. Yes, and um, then you set it, and then you then set, right? Yes, I mean I agree that's different, but we do return something from get parameters and then set it to a different value already. Oh, if we can make it, uh, that's long queue. Let's go to next. Um, I understand the need to have it synchronized uh, with uh, set parameters, and I think it makes a lot of sense. I'm not sure that we necessarily want it to be in the encoding parameter, and we might want to have another um, member in the structure that is passed to um, set parameters. It might be a better compromise. Um, to make it work better with get parameters. That would require to have some read validation, but I don't think that's necessarily a really hard thing to do. Um, one thing that I see that might be an issue is that the symmetric API on a receiver would be very different because we don't have set parameters on receivers. So do you have any idea about what we should do there if we wanted to add um, an API that is doing similar things? We don't have get parameters on receivers either, but there are certainly we use do. cases for that such we do? Yes, Oh, but no set parameters. You yes, can but... see which codecs are negotiated and um, mm, true. headers, header extensions, for example. But for receivers, you have other use cases that might require set parameters, such as adjusting jitter buffer time. But so far, nobody has asked for those. Yes, absolutely. That's maybe something we can work on in the future. Yeah, uh, I, I'm thinking that maybe we should, we want to have something that is not in the encoding parameters, something that is on the side, but still within the same parameters called because that would make uh, synchronization and ergonomics of the API a lot better. Uh, that's it for me. I think I'm next. I, I just wanted to say I, I like the idea of being able to do this, but I don't want to take up too much time because I think we're over time. So uh, I mean, I'm in favor of solving the remaining issues on a pull request, but the use case is thumbs up. Yeah, so uh, quickly, I forgot one thing uh, to ask. Just because the browser is not doing the right thing doesn't mean we need to jump to a JS API. JS API should only be needed if uh, the browser can't figure this out. So I think first we should look at whether maybe changing active, maybe the browser should send a keyframe and then we could standardize that instead of relying on applications to, to, to you know, fix my browser. Thanks. True. Yeah. Let's drain the queue. Uh, yeah, two, two things. Uh, the first thing is, um, so in Anconnect Transform, there's a, a sender a receiver API and there's a, a transform API, and they are they are different, each one of them. So uh, I guess uh, they, par they partly solve different issues. So I guess this one is mostly targeting uh, the sender um, API. 
and it makes sense to me that it's synchronized with set parameters. Um, so we could we could bike shed there. Uh, I guess if uh, if if the user agent default behavior is not good, then maybe it could be a policy that is per peer connection. Uh, if we do not want to to provide the set parameter uh, specific parameters, but I guess it, uh, the transform API itself would still remain. Or are you suggesting to remove it? No, it is probably necessary for some end-to-end -end encryption use cases. Javed, I think oh. you're next. Thanks. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think this makes sense to me. There seems like, like there's two reasons you're gonna wanna deactivate the top layer. Either the person left the call or they're switching down. Uh, so it's like, semantically two different set parameters. Uh, but yeah, I feel like most of the time, almost all the time you're gonna want to send a keyframe when you're uh, removing in a higher layer, except for that last subscriber leaving the call case. And I think also by extension, this means when the sender throttles an upper layer due to bandwidth constraints, uh, that also means we should send a keyframe in that scenario, although that also doesn't involve an API uh, API change. But just, yeah, just like most of the time, we could almost always set a keyframe, uh, not even require an API change. Yeah, we do have existing liberty issues for that discussion. I think issue 12,000. Peter, you're next. I think this is a good approach. I think it's well thought out and it fits well solving the real world need in a simple way. That's it for me. Okay, over to Henrik then. <clears throat> yes. Uh, next slide. Ah, okay. So we're wait, wait. Are you Henrik? Or do we do we have notes for what the next step is? Uh, it's just refine the PR. Is that the next step? I think so. Okay. Yeah. It's All right. Nice to solve the issue. Okay. Well, I'd like to explore, but I can comment on the issue uh, whether we need an API at all if we can just specify the behavior that people want. And if there's a way the browser can't know what the user wants, then we need an API. Sure. Can I go? I'll try to be fast. We all know and love scale resolution down by. It lets you do something like you capture a 720p track, you apply some expensive video effects, and then you send Sybilcast as follows, uh, two layers, Sybilcast. But if the server tells you that 720p is not needed, you can act, uh, inactivate the top layer and you'll just send the, the 360p. You just get a resolution down by two. Uh, the question is now, why are we applying uh, expensive video effects on our 720p track if we're only sending 360p? So what you can do is you change the track si size with apply constraints and then you counteract the effect of this in scale resolution down by. So instead you do scale resolution down by one and because you change the size of the track it's still 360p everyone's happy uh, except next slide you can do this but it's racy so when the if you change the size you will probably send uh, resolutions uh, the wrong resolution on the right wrong layer uh, or, and you will generate keyframes unnecessarily and you know you can try to work around this and inactivate layers to to avoid the uh, jump, jumping up and down but that will also generate more keyframes and perhaps previous slides uh, like what people talked about maybe even more keyframes so um, how about we add a uh, scale resolution down to api where you specify the resolution you want to send rather than a relative term uh in so if you say I want to send 360, then you'll send 360, and it doesn't matter if the track changes size, because the encoder just sends 360. 
and there exists a, a similar API in LibWebRTC. So maybe we can experiment. Thoughts, interest, uh, Peter? So maybe you already have it in the details on the slide, but what happens if you set the top layer to scale down to 360 and then you set the next layer to scale down by two? Does it do half of? Uh, I think to keep things simple, if you if you mix the two, I think we should just throw an exception because they 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 it's uh, two APIs solving the same problem. Okay, uh, so you're basically like either going one or the other, yeah, by a factor or by a specific value. And are we gonna would it allow any resolutions? You could be like three sixty, three fifty, three forty. Well, it's just like scale resolution down by you would be allowed yeah, to. I guess that's true. Do whatever you want, uh, but just like with scale down, uh, we we don't want to upside upsize. So if you if you if the track becomes <laughs> tiny, 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 we're not going to upscale it. Uh, so it's going to be a max right max resolution. Okay. And if you if you say 720, 360, 180, and then you feed in um, something that only has say 360 or the bandwidth limitations are such that 720 can't be sent, then it just drops the top layer? Uh, yeah, I, I, so I, I think we can, uh, there's probably more discussions needed to be had on uh, a potential pull request, uh, like a, like portrait mode and stuff like that as, as okay. well. But but the general idea is do whatever we already do with scale resolution down by, but remove this dependency on the input frame to avoid the race. Gotcha. I think this makes sense. Uh, you end? Oops. Yeah, I got most of the same question as Peter. And uh, so I, I just want to know whether there are uh, like uh, workarounds. I guess you can set active to false and then act, active to true. You, and you yeah, you can set active to or, false and then true. Or like enable but... or false, something like that. And you will have a small glitch that, and hopefully there will be no keyframe because if it's quick enough, then there's, there's no issue. So, so may, maybe it's it's there are workarounds and we can still with with realization done by. I, I don't know. Maybe that's that's the question. I think there's workarounds. Uh, I just uh, I'm not sure how good they are uh, in practice. Grant, uh, I, I think. Um... An API like this would be great. I don't really agree with a single value uh, to say scale resolution down to. As mentioned in other places, there's a problem of uh, orientation. If you have a portrait or landscape uh, capture, um, those, that value will be very different. It will have a different meaning. So we, we might want to talk about the API shape there. Um, there's also something uh, that uh, Peter said, which is what if you feed uh, frames that are smaller with um, lots of different resolutions that are bigger? Um, maybe we want to have an extra mechanism as well to be able to uh, stop sending a layer if a frame size is too small to prevent having. Um, many different uh, thermocast layer that are the same size. If I say 1080p, 720, 360, and I feed 360, I don't want to have three layers that are 360. Um, so we might want to cop uh, couple these with other APIs. I like the direction though. Okay, what's the conclusion? It uh, seems like Generally positive, uh, but details need to be fleshed out. Should I should I provide a pull request? I just want to understand the actual complexity. If it becomes too complex, I would say the work burn is good enough. If it's very simple, then go for it. Okay, so to be investigated. All right, next slide. We can go to the next topic. So track stats, we have uh, the track stats API, which uh, exposes metrics from the capture process to the JavaScript thread. And these metrics are updated on every frame. The original uh, issued uh, file talked about the you know 
calling this excessively it means uh, excessive number of objects created on the GC pile not being ideal for performance. And it's, it's a lot of talk about uh, should the API be asynchronous or synchronous? Should we return a dictionary, i.e. a copy, or an interface, i.e. In, uh, reference to the same object? So there's, there's two main uh, API shapes that have been discussed. There's more, too, but I'm trying to keep it simple. We have a, a wait track dot get stats returning a dictionary, or track dot audio stats or track dot video stats to return an interface. Uh, and next slide. So first of all, the question is, is how big GC, how big of a problem is, is garbage collection? So the intended use case is to pull stats once, once per second per track. Uh, media stream track is not accessible from real time threads. So arguably, you know, should real time pushes be a requirement or not? Uh, and Johnny ever mentioned GC nurseries. Like if you do pull this a lot, uh, temporary objects may or may not uh, be optimized. But I, I'm trying to focus the discussion uh, today on whether it should be uh, synchronous or asynchronous, and uh, focus on ergonomics and performance, because whether we return a dictionary or an interface can be done either way. Uh, next slide. So if you have an async API, you queue a task when the app requests stats. And if you have a synchronous API, then the user agent is forced to continuously queue tasks to update the internal slots, even if the app never requests stats. Uh, I'll get back to that later, but we're talking 30 to 100 times per track, just to anywhere. Oh, go ahead. You can finish. We could do it at the end. Yeah, because I, I'll, I'll try to encompass the, the counters to what you could do. Uh, but anyway. So we're only talking about local capture tracks. So it's not a lot of tasks, 130 per second, if you have an audio and video track. Um, but what I want to at least people to have in their back of their, their mind is because typically when, it, when we add stats, eventually someone asks for more stats. So next slide. Uh, humor me, will you? What if we start to have, what if someone wants uh, stats that are also available? on remote tracks. For a video conferencing use case, you could end up with, uh, you know, do, do some math here, you could have 2,000 plus tasks per second. And what I'm kind of fearing, and whether that's valid or invalid, I'll let you decide. But what I'm fearing is, what if we're in a situation where we need to do IPC in order to grab stats? Uh, so fear. Um, next slide. So the two main things I'm concerned about, is one is the excessive uh, task posting for apps that are only occasionally interested interested in stats, and the other thing I'm, I'm concerned about is if there's cross process metric collection and unnecessary IPC. So next slide. It's been pointed out that the first problem can be avoided with a mutex, and that's true as long as you keep make sure to cache uh, the, the stats to and clear it in the next uh, task execution cycle. Um, the second problem uh, has been proposed that, uh, so next slide, is that you can you can piggyback the metrics update because it's only a few bytes, the counters. Uh, you, can, you can piggyback on other IPC messages. And what I'm not very comfortable with, uh, with that solution is that it assumes IPC happens anywhere uh, anyway. So what if the source of sync lives in different processes? You know, should we be forced to send a bunch of IPC messages uh, just to update these stats that may or may not be read? Uh, next slide. But at the end of the day, this, this is what we're talking about or some version of it. I'm open to suggestions. Um, but we need to decide synchronous or asynchronous, interface or dictionary. I don't think there's a huge difference personally, um, but uh, you know your mileage may vary, and I, I, I would like input on if my concerns are valid or invalid. And on the next slide, which is the last slide before we get to queues, I have three proposals: proposal A, promise, get stats; proposal B. Uh, interface, 
And proposal C is, you know, let's make everyone happy. We, we, we have a synchronous API, but we just say that it should be the latest snapshot. So you could do a batch updates if performance ever becomes a problem. Uh, yes, let's go to the queue. Yuan? Yes, so the use case here is uh, getting stats. It's not getting real-time information. And um, that, that's why you call an API and you get the result. And if you want it like 10 seconds later, uh, you will call again the API and there will be some work being done and, and that's good. In, in the interface case, you get the interface object and then the user agent will start to do processing. No matter whether you start to uh, actually uh, get um, data from it. And uh, this is more suitable for real-time kind of processing, where you are actually querying a lot of this data repetitively, uh, every task you basically, if you even loop task. And I don't think that this use case here is targeting that, because the name of the API is getting stats. And stats are like, yeah, one from time to time, like every second you, you want to get some results, but you, you don't want to get them like every uh, event loop task. So that, that's why I would tend to go with uh, a promise based get, get stats. And uh, if in the future we need like real time information like that, then we, we will be free to uh, add additional APIs. And that's something that is already being done in WebRTC PC, for instance. You can get stats about uh, frames be, being uh, received. And you can also uh, have request video frame callback or media capture transform if you want to know precisely at, at which time the video frame is uh, being received. And these are two different APIs, and this is fine. So proposal A. And January? Uh, yeah, so uh, unfortunately, Paul couldn't be here to, today. So uh, thank you, Henrik, for adding slides uh, to present the two APIs. Uh, I thought I should give a little a bit of input since you advocated for one side here. Um, uh, Paul made a good comment on the issue, I think, uh, revolving IPC. It says this is not a valid argument. Data has to be in the content process anyway. Uh, it's like saying a network data is out of content process. It's true, but irrelevant because it has to be in the content process eventually. And sooner uh, than later, if the implementation is of high quality. And whether real time or not, real time is a spectrum. Uh, it's hard real time, like in a real time audio processing. And there are softer flavors of real time, such as graphics rendering at 60 hertz. Uh, so I think uh, I just feel that this working group has fallen into a pattern that it likes. And it might be good to look at other working groups, like the media working group, uh, that not maybe not everything is a stat. Um, but at the same point, uh, you mentioned queuing a lot of tasks, for example, and using a mutex. Uh, you don't also need to. You, you don't have to use a mutex. You can also do lockless implementations of this, which should. Uh, so there are ways to implement this that doesn't require locking. In, in fact, the W3C design guide says we should not lock in a getter. So uh, lockless would be one option. Uh, I think it comes uh -huh. down to use cases. If, if the use case really is just, this is a feeder API for my graphics library, and I'm going to call it once per second, then you do want a copy of the data, in which case, uh you know a dictionary might be fine but i would just like the working group to consider that other working groups that also deal with real time uh has apis already like uh, media element current time and audio context latency that update just fine and are have simpler apis because their attributes just read which clearly is simpler than having to remember to do a wait and to you know allow other application state to and yield to other application state uh, application code in order to just uh, read some information so that's my feedback <clears throat> i mean the the use case is falling once per second and and i have trouble uh, imagining uh, why you would want to call it pull it at higher frequency from a javascript main thread or equivalent. Um, and also, like, 
if we knew for sure that we're only going to target this, we're never going to add any any more metrics, then fine. Yeah, you, I, I think the piggybacking works. But so my main concern is, well, one is the ergonomics. I don't see a big difference whether you put the await key, keyword in front of it or not. And and secondly, like I guess my concern is one month from now, someone says, oh, what about these other metrics? And and then we've painted ourselves into a corner, uh, which again, with proposal C, you could probably get around, but I, I just don't see uh, why. <laughs> yes, Yuan. Yeah, also to mention with that with the commits based uh, approach, it's very clear that you call the API and you will gather the result. If you have a synchronous API, then you have to identify uh, what is the uh, frequency of uh, how much it will uh, um, be updated. And for instance, the media element runtime, the use case is that it's being, it will be queried to do synchronization with other data, for instance. So you have to update it very frequently. But in an, in an implementation like that, maybe Safari would say, oh, the use case is that, so we will be very uh, lazy and do it like once every second or so. And other browsers will not do that. And then you start to have like uh, different behaviors and then the spec will have to say, okay, you have to update it to that kind of frequency and so on. And it starts to not be uh, great, I think. So th that's why with a promise-based approach, the contract is a bit like clearer as well and fits the use case. So I just like to quote Oprah to say we should make decisions out of love, not out of, out of fear, because we can all play the fear game. Like, what if in the future someone will actually need to read these stats to do real-time audio uh, processing, and then we would have wished we had a, a you know an attribute API. So uh, well, I, I think we, we should make decisions. Else, I guess. Yes, but you know, there's always for every decision, there's a, a you know what didn't happen so i think we should make decisions based on the best information we have now not necessarily try to anticipate every future use hmm. i mean yeah another question would be if we have to uh design it as a real-time API, would, would we feel confident that the synchronous API would be the best choice or not? And uh, I don't know. So we would have to think about it precisely without having the exact uh, real-time use cases that we are trying to, to think of. So that, that's why it's also fuzzy to try to address these use cases while we do not really have uh, the precise information. And also, since it was mentioned on the issue, uh, a variant of the proposal A would be to, sorry, a proposal B would be to have the attributes directly on the track in case the the interface separate interface was uh, confusing to people. Uh, there was some suggestion that you know it might look like you could uh, assign this to a variable and get a copy, for example, which would be less obvious. I, it'd be more obvious, I think, that it's just regular attributes on a track. You're, you're not going to have that problem. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> in terms of ergonomics, again, I, I, I don't see a big difference. If so it, it boils down to synchronous or asynchronous. And, and uh, can, can you try to explain what you meant by lockless? Doesn't that involve post tasks? I think a lockless implementation would be, uh, since you're reading a value from another thread, there are, uh, there are papers and stuff on how you can do that. Uh, without requiring a lock but it just involves a bit uh tricky code uh, paul's the expert on that there, multiple, you, you would need to set multiple values without locks which might be tricky i'm not going to pretend to be the expert on that but paul has uh had a lockless uh implementation of audio context latency for example that is not currently in firefox but we, we have a patch for it that might be useful to add to the. I'll try to add a link to that in the issue. Not quite sure how to proceed. It does seem like like this is a blocking issue for Mozilla. Is that correct? 
I think we would like to hear what the, what other uh, members feel. All right. Does anyone else have any input? All right. I kind of see that uh, the specifying and implementing an, an async in, in interface is simple, probably performance enough, and uh, uh, we can we can do that pretty quickly. Why not? Yeah, why not? Uh, so yeah, not sure what the next steps are. I guess no consensus. Um if we get need to get everyone on board. Okay, well, uh, I guess I'm done with these slides. Who wants to go next? Yeah, sorry, sorry. So, uh, if, if it's just Mozilla on this issue, let me talk to Paul. And it sounds like there's not a lot of other uh, interest in, in an attribute API. So, we'll try to discuss and uh, come back to you. Okay, thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Samir, and uh, I would like to continue our discussion on the ICE controller uh, slash WebRTC ICE APIs. So to recap the discussion thus far, uh, in, at the previous interim meeting, Peter and I uh, proposed a set of improvements to the API that will incrementally allow applications to uh, control ICE to an increasingly greater extent. Uh, there was a positive, possibly cautiously positive response to it. Uh, so I've uh, gone ahead and I uh, would like to start the discussion on the first of those set of improvements. So I've uh, written up an issue on WebRTC extensions repo. Uh, I'll try and keep this brief so we have enough time for discussion. Uh, but the first uh, increment is basically to uh, prevent the removal of a candidate pair. The main use case for this is to maintain connection redundancy and uh, gradually build on this to be able to switch the connection to uh, another connection a candidate pair. Uh, so a canonical use case for this would be when you have several network interfaces or several options to connect your call and uh, Let's say you can choose between relay and not relay, or uh, between Wi Fi and cellular, or Wi Fi and Ethernet. Uh, you start off the call on one of those connections, gradually it deteriorates for whatever reason, and you would like to switch the call to a different candidate pair uh, without doing a nice restart, without waiting for a nice disconnect. So, that would be a good use case to prevent, uh, to keep a candidate pair uh, around. So, on the next slide. So there's a couple of different approaches to this. Uh, we've uh, talked about these a bit before, but to summarize, uh, we can do a cancelable event. So this is when the ICE agent has uh, decided to remove a candidate pair, but before that removal has actually happened, uh, there will be an event that the application can cancel. Uh, and prevent the removal, of, removal from taking place. And the other is the ICE agent continues to do what it does. The application just provides inputs to the ICE agent by setting certain attributes on a candidate pair. Uh, and uh, to reiterate, in either of those cases, the existing behavior does not change. It is only when the application takes some steps to change the behavior, uh, anything different happens. So on the next slide, Going a bit more into cancelable events. So uh, 
yeah, the basic idea is the ICE agent, when it decides that it wants to remove a candidate pair, it uh, stops, uh, it pauses that action uh, temporarily and lets the application know that it's about to remove a candidate pair. And then it waits uh, for that event uh, to finish dispatch. If the application calls prevent default on the event, uh, the ICE agent does not remove that event. It can come back and propose removing that event at a later time. That's completely fine. Uh, this is the way other events work in the case of touch or form submit events. So this is an established uh, pattern in some use cases. Uh, on the left is what the API proposal looks like. Uh, so on RDC ICE transport, there's a new event uh, for uh, a new event can be fired uh, when the candidate pair removal is being proposed. Uh, and then on the right is how an application would use it. So in the event listener, uh, call prevent default if you want the candidate pair to stay around. Simple as that. On the next slide. So changing the automatic behavior instead. So there's a, another couple of ways to do this. So one uh, approach we've already talked about in the past is to have a removable attribute on a candidate pair. So on the left again is the API proposal. So uh, RDCI's transport can have an event to, uh, that is fired when a candidate pair is added and the application can set the removable flag on that to true uh, if that is oh, sorry, uh, removable to uh, false by default it's true and if this is false then the ice agent does not remove the candidate pair uh, the flag could be set uh, either in the event listener or it could be set at a later time as well uh, we can discuss a bit towards the end uh, what the best approach to do this might be, but for now I'll continue to the second option here on the next slide. Yeah. So another uh, approach to do this is instead of a removable attribute, uh, there's a timeout on a candidate pair. And then we leave the lifecycle management of the candidate pair to the ICE agent. The application just states what the timeout should be for a candidate pair. And then the ICE agent can remove the candidate pair once that timeout has expired. Uh, and the semantics of the timeout is the duration since the last ICE check occurred on this candidate pair or since data was sent or received. Uh, so it works pretty much the same way uh and uh, the net here is that uh, the application could actually reduce the timeout from the default value as well so you could have a candidate pair getting removed earlier than it was planned or you could set it to the max value in which case it's equivalent to not having the candidate pair removed at all so that's the three proposed approaches uh So on the next slide, so that's a discussion point. So let me quickly go over these. So uh, A, is there a, a completely different approach uh, that we could take to this? Uh, and then we don't need to necessarily take the same approach to all of the events that are in those uh, set of proposed improvements. So we could decide that uh, maybe it's best to leave the lifecycle management of uh, candidate pairs to the ICE agent. And so here we do attributes, but then for uh, for figuring out how, uh, how often to do uh, pings or how to switch candidate pairs, uh, cancelable events makes more sense over there. Like that's, I think, a reasonable uh, question to ask. Uh, and then in case of attributes, is it better to just set attributes, to have settable attributes or uh, would it be a better option to have methods that can fail if uh, setting the attribute does not make sense? So one example of this would be the ICE agent is already in the process of removing or it has already removed a candidate pair, but the event hasn't fired yet. Uh, what happens when the application sets removable to false? 
So does that get silently ignored or should that be an error condition? Uh, and then lastly, uh, it may be reasonable to say that this is not the thing that we should be uh, tackling right away. Maybe there's, a, there's something further along in the list that we should be talking about instead. So that's the discussion point, so I'll open it up. Uh, Peter? All right, can you hear me? Yeah. Is there too much background noise? Let me know if there is. Um, I think that this makes sense as the first thing to do, although it, we should admit that it is more useful once you can uh, select which candidate pair you're sending with. Um, I It's no surprise I like the removed uh, attribute. I do think it make, would make sense to have a set removable, or sorry, the removable attribute and having a set removable method in case it can fail. Um, the idle timeout seems interesting, but I'd have to think about it more because there might be some complexity there, and it also might not be obvious to developers to set it to max value to make it not removable. Um, so that's it. Uh, all right. I see a slight problem here in that uh, removal of candidates isn't timer driven. Uh, candidates are usually removed when they fail. And um, and, uh, and uh, if we had uh, done the thing that I specifies with with the end of candidates and uh, going to connect a uh, completed state, then uh, we would throw everything away at uh, the time of completed when we actually chose the candidate. So uh, I don't think that uh, proper uh, ICE implementation can uh, will fit well with the timeout. So I think that because of this, the cancelable event is is a better fit because that uh, that allows the ICE engine to do whatever it thinks is, is correct according to ICE protocol. Uh, oh, yeah, so, so sorry, I'm, I'm not an ICE expert. So I, of the proposal proposed, I kind of, without seeing the whole picture, uh, I, I kind of like prevent default on the remove one, because uh, otherwise I don't see a purpose why you need a callback for adding one if it's the only way if the only purpose uh, to get notified of adding is so that you can remove it that seems like more api surface than we need uh, so i like prevent default that seems like a decent enough thing if the real goal really is to prevent the user agent from removing a pair but it's still not clear to me what behavior you actually expect what do you expect the user agent to do by by preventing it from removing this thing like what is the actual functionality that, that you're looking for? And could that be expressed? Is the problem here that I know this ICE transport does not let you actually look at all the pairs. You can get selected pair, but uh, that seems to be the only use for uh, where we return RTCI's candidate pair. So it's this, this is an insight problem into the state of things, um, you know, if there are other grander designs uh, that might help other than that, yeah, I, based on the information available, I would pick the, the first option A, which was to prevent the default. But if you could talk about a little bit uh, what what happens then? So you prevented the user agent from removing this pair and what what is different than before? Right. So uh, let me see if I understand. So uh, I, I could probably answer. Sorry, so this is definitely the first uh, set of improvements. So uh, enumerating all the candidate pairs that are uh, active or that are around at a certain point, that's certainly one of the further proposals. Uh, so we would want to do that as well at some point. But the main reason to keep candidate pairs alive uh, as proposed right now is to be able to switch to a different candidate pair at a certain time in the future when the application decides that. 
So using a new API at that time. Exactly. Yes, which is also further down the list of uh, post improvements. Thanks. But but to answer the question of what the behavior change would be if you prevent the removal, it's that the ICE agent, the browser, would continue sending checks on that candidate pair. OK, cool. Thanks. Yeah. Tim? Yeah, so that makes me wonder what happens if it should be removing it. Like, if you, um, like, you get, a, you get an event which says that it's removing this candidate pair because it's not working or because IPv6 has disappeared or something, I don't know. Um, like, you don't want to prevent that default. Right. So uh, removal is meant only for candidate pairs that actually makes sense to have around. So yes, of course, if one of your network interfaces goes down, uh, any candidate pairs associated with that should be uh, deleted. That's a different, that's a deletion event versus a removal event, which is, this is a redundant candidate pair that's not necessary anymore. And so the ICE agent decides to remove that. Okay, thanks. Anyone? Yeah, that seems confusing. Like maybe the application just wants to keep a log of what's being uh, removed and deleted. So, so you're saying it would it would only fire the event. Maybe it's a bike shedding issue. Uh, like voluntarily, you know, remove remove working pair or something. Uh, but yeah, but maybe that could be worked out in bike shedding. But it seems confusing because I thought you would get the event for every candidate pair that was tossed. Mm. So yeah. uh, I do also want to mention I'm I'm not I'm still not 100 percent sure it's relevant here, but there is the possibility for uh, the user agent to fire cancelable events that aren't actually cancelable. So an event could be cancelable, but this instance of the event isn't cancelable. So that's perfectly valid. Right, but the application wouldn't know what to do then, right? It would prevent default on something that's not working, and the user agent would just figure it out, I guess. Right. Yeah. So but calling then, to a default on an event that isn't cancelable doesn't do anything. Right. The application might be confused though about what to expect, but yeah. but I guess it can read that out. Yeah. Uh I think it's mostly indeed a bike shedding issue and the term removal uh, is indeed a bit ambiguous and you might assume that it includes both deleted and what you call removed uh, candidates. Uh, but, but I think we should fix it by picking the right name, uh, possibly explaining it better, but still keep separate events for uh, things that are recoverable and things that aren't uh, and things on which the developer should act and things on which it's mostly uh, an FYI. So I, I do like the distinction. I think it's mostly a matter of how it is, how it is surfaced in the API shape. Yeah, I think the RFC uses, <coughs> uses the word prune for, uh, for optionally for these, for this situation. It's, yeah, yeah. So uh, in my uh, very first ice controller proposal, I did use the term prune, and maybe we want to come back to that. Uh, so again, that might be a naming thing that we can buy to do our uh, PR. I, uh, I would note that we're approaching uh, the end of time for this segment. So mm -hmm. can we wrap it up? So uh, to maybe summarize, so it seems like uh, I'm hearing more support for uh, the cancelable event approach. I'm happy to write up a PR uh, on that, and then we can continue the discussion on that, if that makes sense. OK, that's me. Thank you. All right. Last time I talked about an idea for something called RTP transport, and there was some feedback, and I wanted to follow up on that feedback. The three main things that I heard were, what are the use cases? Is there a gap between somebody using RTP transport with Web Codex versus WebRTC? You know, if you want, if you were using WebRTC and you wanted to move to Web Codex and Web RTP transport, how much trouble is it? 
and lastly, providing examples instead of web ideal. So I just wanted to have a short follow up on these things. So this is a list of the things people have asked me that they would like to be able to do that I think RTP transport solves. Uh, for example, people want to be able to send custom data along with the audio and video, either in the same packets or separate packets, but in the same congestion control context with RTP to an endpoint that speaks RTP for audio and video, but they want to include, say, 3D avatar data. Uh, people want to be able to do their own uh, packetization, sometimes because they have a new codec, like HEVC, which is supported in web codecs, at least for decode. Um, or they want to do their own style of packetization for existing codecs. For example, H.264 has lots of ways you could do packetization. And sometimes people want a particular one and not what WebRTC happens to spit out. Uh, more generally, there are lots of low-level controls on codecs inside of web codecs. And people would like to have those controls, but also be able to have a real-time peer-to-peer transport, which WebRTC provides. Uh, and if we if it RTP transport, then that would combine well together. Um, one An example of that is controlling keyframes which we've talked about already today. And in particular, if you're doing SVC, you'd be able to control the exact uh, style of the layer refreshes. Um, along with that, people will want to be able to send uh, RTCP messages that are newly defined, for example, the layer refresh, um, and not have to wait for it to be added to the WebRTC implementation. Um, some people want to bring their own codec, do some Wasman audio, or maybe even use WebGPU for ML-based codecs and they want to be able to send that over RTP, um, or generally control lots of things, uh, bring your own bitrate allocation, or your own FEC, or your own RTX, or your own jitter buffer. And along with custom RTCP messages and RTP data, there are existing in RTP endpoints that sometimes have um, their own RTP data, RTP messages that they want to do. And so this would allow for better interop. Someone raise their hand. Tim. Yeah, just in a burst of pedantry based on the on the initial segment. I'm not convinced these are use cases. Sure. Uh, we, th these are things people want to be able to do. I don't okay, know. okay, cool. Good, thank you. Uh, next slide. All right, so what about the gap? So this is the diagram I showed before. RTP transport on one side, web codecs on the other, the app in the middle. Uh, but there's stuff, if you wanted to replicate WebRTC today, that you'd have to provide. Next slide. In particular, there's packetization, depacketization, and jitter buffer. Jitter buffer, probably the biggest one. Next slide. So uh, don't be scared of this. Uh, I'll explain. So on the left, uh, instead of one web codex, we, I just split it into audio encoder and decoder, video de encoder and decoder. And then I said, OK, what if we provided a couple um, other objects to fill that gap in. I alluded to this at my last presentation. For example, you could have an RTP packetizer or a jitter buffer, both for audio and video. And then the app would kind of just have to tie these things together, and there would be a lot smaller gap between uh, web codecs plus RTP transport and the existing WebRTC. Next slide. So this is how it would look. It's not web ideal. It's an example of JavaScript. Um, Basically, if you created a transport and a packetizer and, and you got a frame, encoded frame for web codecs, then you would just pass that into the packetizer, and it would give you packets that you can send on the transport. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Next slide. Depacketization, I was thinking, could be just built into the jitter buffer. So if you created a video jitter buffer, you just take the RTP packet that comes over the transport, stuff it into the uh, video jitter buffer with the method, say, insert packet, and then when the video Jitter buffer assembles a frame, uh, it would have a callback that says, here's a, an assembled frame. And then you could pass that to web codecs to decode. Next slide. The audio jitter buffer is a little bit different um, because at least the implementation of the WebRTC that everybody uses, uh, it, the decoding and the error concealment and the time dilation are all kind of tied together. So what you really want to come out is not uh, assembled audio frames, but rather uh, in fact, you don't really assemble an audio frame. <laughs> and depacketization is so straightforward. What you're really trying to do is get decoded audio. So here, you would have something where you insert audio packets, and at the end, you have something you can render. Uh, a straightforward way to do that would be with a track, but that has kind of cross-worker problems. So we'd have to think of a way to allow 
the audio jitter buffer to work in a, uh, being a worker and be able to render um, despite that. So there is that issue. But for simplicity, I just said, hey, there's a track here on this slide. Uh, next slide. There are some other things in the gap I haven't talked about. Uh, there's things like RTX, FEC, sorry, misspelled that, and RED. Um, we could try to further the gap still by providing things like that, or we could say, hey, it's just the JavaScript library. I don't know, it's up to us, I guess. Next slide. Um, I did want to provide more examples because that's what was requested as part of the feedback. Um, this is an example of custom data. You could say, OK, my 3D avatar data is going to be payload type 126. And I'm going to pick an SSRC. And I'm going to just pack in the data however I choose. It's custom. And then I call send RTP packet, where I specify the payload type, SSRC, and payload. Next slide. An example of bring your own packetization might be that with web codecs, I create an HEVC decoder. And then I create my own depacketizer just my own custom thing. And then on the, on the transport, I get the RTP packet. I hand the RTP packet over to the depacketizer. Once it's decided it has a whole frame, then it hands me that, and I decode it using the HEVC decoder. Next slide. Oh, that's it. Uh, so discussion. I have a few questions. Um, one of them is about use cases. Do we need more use cases? Like, what what is required to convince people that uh, we need to do something here. Another one is, do we need more examples? I just provided a few simple ones. Uh, but if we want more complete examples, perhaps, what, what exactly do people want? Um, more generally, should we try to fill this gap? Uh, or should we leave it up to JavaScript libraries? I think there's a good case to be made for the audio jitter buffer. The others, I'm not so sure. Um, and where do we go from here? Somebody suggested writing an explainer. Should we do that? All right, we got 10 minutes. Bernard, you're on the top. Yeah, so um, thank you, Peter. This is uh, this is actually quite helpful to have the examples and stuff. Um, I just wanted to comment on some of the things and just uh, I had a few questions. We'll see on these examples. Um, so what, one of the questions I had was about handling of SSRCs and stuff and whether that would could be considered a gap. Because like if you're trying to use this to build a, some conferencing thing, you have a ton of SSRCs that are coming in. And you know you got to keep track of them, figure out where they go. Is there some case for help you know, and, and for helping to manage these things? Like um, you know, at least in WebRTC, you just can't receive an SSRC out of nowhere. You know, it has to be negotiated, so it has to be registered somehow that you're expecting it to show up. Um, so that's that's kind of one one question is is there, you know, is it is it do you just does this just give you anything that comes in any random SSRC and you handle it yourself, or is there some management functionality? Um, another question is about the deep packetizer here. Like I, I actually think. So you, and originally you were talking about the video G, video buffer kind of building in the depacketizer, but here you get to do your own. And I guess are you saying that there would be a generic video uh, buffer that would be you could somehow distinguish the depacketizer from that? Uh, so you got two things there. One about the SSRCs. Uh, you, you, I think what you're highlighting is that another part of the gap is an RTP demuxer. I was thinking that this would just uh, hand you the packet. You you do the demuxing, but mm -hmm. if you wanted the demuxer logic provided, then I, I suppose you would want an object that's like RTP demuxer, where you say, okay, here are some SSRCs and and a mid and a rid, and you know right. when it when it pops out, give me some identifier, uh, maybe the mid. Uh, so yeah, an RTP demuxer is something that is in the gap that I didn't bring up and could be provided. Um, on the yeah, deep what that would do, it'd be nice in that you you'd have like a handler for that particular stream, right? That might be different from other handlers, so you could you could uh, actually know you know you could get that particular. You you might want to do something different when you get that stream versus other right, ones. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, on the depacketization side, audio and video are a little separate here. For video, I was thinking that if you took an audio a video jitter buffer and you said my 
maximum time is zero, then basically you end up with uh, a depacketizer. Uh, right. For audio, depacketization is so trivial that I don't okay. know if it's worth, <laughs> worth having. And the last question I had was about audio video sync, because that's the thing mm. that seems to be the nastiest, one of the nastiest things. And I'm wondering, um, you know, if you're just outputting these tracks that are independent, I haven't really tried it with Media Stream Track Generator, but people have been asking for samples. I know when I wrote the web transport samples, they're always asking me, hey, can you show how sync would work? You know, they're afraid that this will just be a big mess if you just output separate audio and video tracks. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. All right, two things to add to the gap: demuxing and AV sync. <laughs> uh, Yanni Bar. Uh, yes. So, uh, if you go back to the use cases, uh, th thank you first for uh, for uh, these slides. They're very helpful. Um, I do worry though that uh, we're abandoning the existing WebRTC API a little bit when we're saying that to solve problems like custom data along with audio and video, for example, has been a long requested feature. And so if our answer is going to be, well, to do that, stop using, doing what you're doing now and then use this RTP API. So I'm a little worried about that. Similarly, I, so my first reaction would be maybe we should solve time synchronization with data on the data channel with some time codes. And there might be other ways to solve it. So I'm, I'm worried that by focusing on switching API, basically, we're saying we're not going to solve these problems in the old API. Uh, and the other thing I hear here is that people want to use web codecs as a use case. And I think it's worth looking at, well, why is WebRTC not exposing the same codec choices as web codecs? Uh, again, there might be users that would like these features without having to go to this very low level API. And the, the third one is that we already, uh, both Chrome and Firefox now ship web transport, uh, which offers this low level API using uh, what WG streams. And so there's, I have a lot of questions. This API right now seems to be using events and uh, operates at a very low level uh, by sending packets basically. Uh, so the range goes from, I think from the top of the list, uh, there's some general use cases, uh, but it gets more and more specifically. Uh, the last one is basically I want RTP, right? It's just I want to be able to have custom RTCP and RTP data. So I'm not sure that these all necessarily need to be solved or should be solved um, with a new API. And maybe, maybe there's. Uh, Maybe we're stepping on web transport a little bit, and I understand web transport is not P2P. Uh, maybe that's something we could look at. But it sounds like I'm, I'm worried that we're adding a little too many APIs that do similar things. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. So um, I on web transport, I you know I was obviously I'm a fan, but it, it's not P2P yet, and it's not uh, doesn't have real time congestion control algorithm yet, and it also uh, will not interoperate with existing. RTP endpoints ever. So um, there are pay situations in which RTP transport would be more suitable than web transport, at least at the moment, and maybe for a long time because of interop. On the question of uh, web codecs, I, I actually did design uh, an alternative to using web codecs with RTP transport, where it was like we define um, media senders and receivers that are like an RTP sender and receiver, but only the media half and then you tie it to the, the transport half, and then you can control things in between. But it ended up being almost exactly like web codecs. So it was like a lot of duplicate uh, stuff. So we could go down that road where we say, instead of having web codecs and an extra thing, we just bundle those together and we say, OK, there's this thing that's the media half of RTP centered and receiver. And if people are interested in that, we could try going down that path too. Uh, but I, I felt like there was a lot of duplication there with web codecs. And there are situations where these objects might be useful outside of um, the RTP transport. Uh, lastly, you talk about abandoning the WebRTC API. Um, you know, maybe like part of what I'm trying with this fill in the gap part is to lower the, the difference so that if you're using the WebRTC peer connection and then drop down 
uh, it's not such a big gap drop. But I don't have much sympathy for someone saying, hey, I, I, we're abandoning peer connection because like, th that would be great if we never have to see peer connection again. <laughs> Uh, and and everybody uses something better, so. Sure, uh, I'm I'm just saying. Uh, are we saying we're not going to solve custom data along audio and video in the existing WebRTC peer connection API? I I think JitterBuffer Dev like uh, Firefox has just um, implemented JitterBuffer Target, for example. So no, I so think there there are yeah. a lot of things there are a lot of things here that we can continue to do incrementally, like the keyframe uh, control. I, I don't think we'll ever get through all of it. And uh, certainly at the pace that we're going, uh, it will basically be forever for app developers that want to do stuff. And they'll, hmm. um, they might just give up on RTP and want to use, uh, or, I don't know, right now you can't do anything else peer to peer. So I'm trying to provide a way for, for uh, app developers, but we only have two minutes and there's still a lot of people in the queue, sorry. Yes. So you in. Yeah, I heard, um, so since we are on the use cases slides, uh, I heard people asking for uh, some of the same things, and I think it's fine. And uh, for things like, uh, let's try to, to do HVC, um, I think that uh, there are some niche uh, things where it will be hard to convince uh, user agents to actually support it. Uh, and then having a, an RTP transport uh, is actually good. Um, I, I would echo uh, Yannivar uh, issues with what is the future there? Uh, is, it, is the future that we do uh, RTP transport and then it's GS, like web transport and web codex approach? Or are, are we still planning to evolve the RTC peer, peer connection? And uh, one thing that is related to peer connection is that it's tied together. It's working smoothly, consistently together, and it has some perf advantages as well. So it would be interesting to see uh, with web codex existing applications, whether uh, it's easy for an application doing real time to actually have uh, uh, very good performance compared to peer connection and being able to deploy uh, smoothly. Uh, that, that would help us understand whether RTP transport would be like the future or not. Uh, in terms of how to make evolve uh, this, I, I think an explainer would be good. Uh, it would be nice. Um, related to packetizer, Twitter buffers, and so on, um, I would think that web transport based apps will uh, might want something like that, like for games or whatever, if at some point web transport is, is good enough. Um, so in the short term, I, I would be against developing something like that. I think that we, we should check whether GS is not sufficient. In most cases, GS should be sufficient, like uh, G, audio GTA buffer, use audio workload, shared audio buffer, blah, blah, blah. It, it's expensive because you need to be very uh, good at GS programming, but you should be able to, to get to it. And uh, we should concentrate on uh, our own effort, which is the RTP transport uh, on peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, that's what we're trying to solve. So that's why we should uh, focus on. But still, it's interesting to be able to have like an idea of what a packetizer or a buffer is, so that you design the transport API so that it's it's able to integrate well with these other uh, packetizers and digital buffers. So that's why it's good to have a look at it, but clearly not focus on it in, in terms of, of spec. And uh, that's it. Thanks, Ewan. Harold? Yeah, so uh, I very much want uh, RTP con RTP the, the peer connection to explode into a, into a maze of objects all different. But uh, I'm a bit afraid of uh, trying it, to do it by defining a new object at one end and then say that, okay, there's this long thing over in, at the other end called web codec, and you just have to fill in the gap yourself. I would rather concentrate on uh, defining APIs. I mean, the, the encoder transform API has been very successful in its own way. It's defined a, a dividing point within the within the RTP RTP sender that divides the codec from the from the packetizer, and uh, 
I'm not very happy with the way we ended up with the API for inst instantiating that. So I've, I'm uh, working on proposing revisions, but uh, the I think we need to focus on. I, I think we'll get there faster if we define APIs like uh, an RTCP sending API, RTP RTP receive. RTP send receive API and say, here's how you tell the pay connection that you want access to this API to plug your own thing in. And then, and then if you, if we do it right, then the two sides of the, of the API don't have to talk to each other except the API. I think breakout books did a much better job than, uh, than encoded insertable streams on on that kind of break apart. And if we can continue breaking apart that way, well, at every step of the breaking apart, we have a working system. I think we'll get, it will be, it looks like more work, but I think we'll actually get, get somewhere faster. And we can co course correct on the way. Thanks, Harold. Jared? Yeah, what, what I really like about this is, well, like it'll probably never be an official use case, but like just RTP transport uh, makes makes me picture these like really nice SFUs where all the like congestion control, NACs, RTCP, header extensions, like that's all nicely packaged in RTP transport. And you can make this SFU uh, easily now that interops perfectly with the client. And then, yeah, I also agree with like everything Jane of is saying uh, that it, I would rather try to let people uh, do as much as possible without having to fully unbundle everything. Like if you just want to be able to use a web codec, uh, you shouldn't have to unbundle, the, uh, do all this unbundling. Uh, and yeah, I also am slightly worried of like, these leaky API boundaries, like how, like congestion, congestion uh, window pushback, or like transport uh, congestion control messages, uh, can end up like telling the encoder to drop frames coming in from, uh, coming in from the camera. Uh, it's just like how many leaky abstractions are there, uh, and how many will we support? Okay, thank you, Jared. Uh, Bernard? Yeah, um, I'd like to pick up on one last thing, uh, which has been a little bit of a loose end. Um, both the Insertable Streams API and Coda Transform and Media Capture Transform have used streams, what WD streams. Um, and uh, quite a while ago, UN raised some issues about what WD streams. I don't think they have been completely uh, put to bed. Um, and we've had, we have a bunch of demo code now, uh, but I don't, uh, there, one of the big questions I think in this API will be, should it be streams based or not? Um, and I think the danger of not using streams is that there can be some issues when you, I think this, it's very possible this API will need to run in a worker, particularly along with web codecs. And so you'll have issues if you don't do things right. You'll have issues because we don't have transferable media stream tracks. If we don't um, aren't able to leverage transferable streams, I think you can have issues in in uh, functioning with workers. So I don't I don't want a situation where we've seen this. A lot of developers are starting to transfer individual encoded chunks or individual video frames to workers. It's it's not it's not hap not working very well. So I think I think the streams discussion is an important thing to pick up and figure out. Thank you, Bernard. Um, Bernard it sounds Bernard, like what I should just to mention okay, that the stream API issues uh, are being resolved. Uh, it, it's uh, it's underway in the in the spec at least. So oh, there should oh, be progress. So and particularly the one about um, needing one one object in in every queue is that one getting fixed? Um, maybe not this one, but tr transferring ownership uh, on all these things there will be. So we, we yeah. could look at uh, fixing that one as well. I guess. At the same time. Yeah, 
because that that one the interesting thing you is there's a bunch of measurements that have been made and they're showing higher end-to-end -end delay than you would expect i think it may be due to that uh, that one object per per pipeline stage anyway thank you for the update all right well i'm taking away is the um next steps to make an explainer and um explore ways to incrementally move this direction um, something like that but I, I do appreciate lots of feedback that I got so thank you that's it for me okay uh, well we actually got to the end of <laughs> the working group um, so I'm going to say thank you to everybody. I didn't have an animal uh, at the end, which is usually our reward for getting done. Uh, but thank you, everybody, and we will meet again in June. See you all then. Yeah. Bye.